to The Fish Nerd, the show about fish, fishing, and eating fish. I'm Clay Groves, Chief Executive Fish Nerd of the Fish Nerds Podcast and Licensed Fishing Guide, and I'm super happy to be here. It was just Thanksgiving, just a couple of days ago. I'm still fat from turkey eating, I'm tired, I'm grouchy, I'm all the things that you feel after a long weekend, but I'm still making the podcast for you, and I was thinking about it today about what I'm thankful for. I'm thankful that I've got this podcast. More importantly, I've got people like you listening to the podcast. So thank you, everyone, for for leaving reviews on iTunes or or Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or wherever. Thank you to those who support us financially on Patreon uh, and those who just share the podcast around and contribute um, by telling people about it. Telling people about the podcast is probably the biggest help you can be to this show. So if you like it, Tell your friends, hey, I know this great podcast called The Fish Nerds. They talk about all things fish. You know, they're not an ice fishing show or a fly fishing show or a cooking show or the all fish everything show. So we're glad to have you. If you're new to the show, welcome. I'm thankful for you as well. We need more listeners. We're just about to crack the 90,000 downloads number on Apple Podcasts. So about we've had 89,800 and something listeners since we started with, uh, not since we started the podcast, since we switched service to Libsyn, it doesn't matter. We're hitting about 90,000. We're hoping to get to 100,000 by the new year. And the only way to get there is to tell your friends about us. So tell your friends about us. In fact, I just thought of something really fun. Go on your phone or whatever and share our podcast with whoever you want, with your own page, with your friends or whatever, and then send me a screenshot of that. It's clay at fishners.com. Send me a screenshot of you sharing our podcast with a friend. And if you do that, I will send you a Fish Nerds decal made for us by our friends over at Backwoods Graphics. So you get a nice little decal and your friend gets a nice show to listen to. So that's our, our freebie this week. So tonight on the show, uh, again, glad you're here, we're going to play a little Stump Stump the the Fish Nerd. Fish Guy Josh is back with a visit to a conference called the Also Conference. I took a visit to North Country Angler in North Conway, New Hampshire to give Steve some advice on stocking ice fishing gear. He's a fly shop and wants to be an all things fishing store. In a new segment called FN Reviews and the FN West is back. The amazing James Fish Guy Josh are back together in one room. This episode is brought to you by the Fish Nerds Guide Service, serving the Mount Washington Valley of New Hampshire. If you're looking for a uh, quality ice fishing trip, give us a call or go to our website, fishnerds.com, and book a trip. This year, we're starting a new four-week teen ice fishing clinic. It'll be Sundays from 1 till 5 p.m. You drop your kid off, I take them fishing, uh, teach them some cool stuff, and I give them back to you at 5 o'clock, and I'll feed them, too. Totally fun, and we're only going to take eight anglers um, at a time. And it's if you sign up before the 12th of December, it's only $175 per kid, maximum of eight kids. Price is only good until the 12th of December, then it goes up to $200. But even that's a good price. It should be a lot of fun, and I'm excited about it. Stay tuned for more details. Go to fishners.com to read all about it. I want to do a quick shout out to the podcasters over at the Twisted 10 podcast. And the reason I want to bring them up is, first of all, they've been talking about the fish nerds a lot on their show, which I appreciate. But second, they've been dealing with a topic that I'm super interested in, which is the flat earth debate, which is not really a debate so much as a bunch of people who are willfully stupid, trying their very best to um, ignore science and the world around them and make up their own stuff. And I, I was the first time I've ever called them stupid publicly, but uh, they are. But they're really fun, and they're in the news a lot, and I'm obsessed. I watch every Flat Earth video I could find. I listen to Flat Earth podcast. But the Twisted Ten has an episode coming out soon, which has the fish nerd's response to the Flat Earth, including Doc Martin and a physics professor, me, and our very good friend Jeff Donaldson, our FN librarian, talking all about it. That's coming soon. In the meantime, you can check out the Twisted Ten podcast or wherever you get your podcast. That's going to be really, really fun. But uh, uh, I'll keep you up posted when that gets released. Uh, it's totally interesting. If you're interested in listening to uh, people try really hard to ignore science, definitely check out the Flat Earth podcast. It's really, really fun. And I guarantee you, you'll spend a good portion of your day yelling at your iPod. All right, how about a little stump, stump the fish nerds? 
All right, and so this call came in from Rich Collins. Here's the call. Hey there, this is Fish Nerd Rich. I had a question about stocked fish. I wondered, A, if they are viable spawning fish. That means if they can actually create and spawn like normal fish, even though they're frankenfish. And B, even if they go through the motions of spawning, will those um, eggs and fry actually produce baby fish or is it they just go through the motions because i know they produce milk and things like that so i'm wondering the viability of stocked genetically identical fish spawning in um the rivers that they're put in thanks and essentially what rich is asking us is do stocked trout reproduce i think rich knows the answer to this but i'm going I'm to tell you anyway uh for me the answer is of course they do because they're animals that can reproduce but i i wanted to kind of go a little deeper so i found an article by the new york times put out a couple of years back and i pulled some segments from that i'm going to just read to you when adult hatchery trout are suddenly thrust into a stream where wild trout have already established a stable social order, and this is a quote, they run around like a motorcycle gang and making trouble wherever they go. And this is from Dr. Robert Bachman, who's a behavioral ecologist and directs the Maryland Freshwater Fisheries Division. Uh, the new arrivals charge around the stream in tight schools, which is different than what wild fish would do, and they provoke fights everywhere they can go. This conflict is, is chaos is everywhere, and Dr. Rotman found eventually results in fewer fish of either kind, so fewer stock fish and fewer wild fish. Other studies also found that stocking tends to reduce the number of wild trout. The hatchery uh, trout dwindle too, since they are generally more easily caught and less adept at feeding on wild fare. The outcome is often an impoverished fishery dependent on periodic fixes to stocked fish. So it's kind of like an anti-stocking thing. Of more serious concern are the genetic risks posed by the stocking programs. The genetic integrity of some wild strains and at least one species is being threatened by interbreeding and hybridization. Meanwhile, hatcheries in some cases have produced populations of trout and salmon with less genetic variety than is found in the wild. As these fish breed with wild trout, scientists say they erode the natural gene pool and may impair the ability of wild fish to adapt genetically to environmental changes. So yes, they reproduce. And the question is, uh, do they reproduce well? And the answer is no, they don't do it very well. Now in New Hampshire, we've got some small populations of wild brown trout and wild rainbows. Both started with being stocked fish. And some anglers are really protective of the brown trout and the rainbows and are excited about them. I feel like I don't care. Um, <laughs> they probably don't belong here anyway. And so do we really need to make a big fuss about it? So it's up to you how you feel about it. But to answer Rich's question, yes, they reproduce. And yes, they are inferior. But they are here. And they are reproducing. And it makes sense that they would be doing that. If you want to get your question answered at Stump the, Stump the Fish Nerds, call 607-378-FISH and leave us a voicemail. I'd be happy to find the answer for you and chat it up here on the show. <laughs> How about if we jump over to a little bit of Fish Guy Josh, who went to the Aquatic Animal Life Support Operations Conference. That's a mouthful. Here's Fish Guy Josh. Fish Guy meets Fish Guys. Fish Guy, Fish Guy. Fish Guy meets Fish Guys. Fish Guy, Fish Guy Josh. Well, that smooth lounge jingle can only mean one thing. It is time for another episode of Fish Guy Meets Fish Guys. So this week we're going to dive into the fish nerd subculture world of aquarium nerds. More specifically, aquarium filtration nerds. I know that may not even sound like it's a real thing, but trust me, it is. Earlier this year, I went to the ALSO conference in St. Louis, of which I'm a member of. Now, ALSO stands for... Aquatic Animal Life Support System Operators. And it's an organization of various system engineers, uh, life support operators, water quality technicians, things of that nature. Basically, the guys that are sort of the unsung heroes of the aquarium world that don't really deal with the fish, but deal more so in equipment, engineering, chemistry, things of that nature. Now, while I was there, uh, I spent most of my time kind of bouncing around, attending various talks, sort of doing uh, some networking, checking out the sales floor, and uh, actually doing a few certification tests while I was there. But 
I am a trusty Fish Nerds correspondent, so I made sure that I had my recorder there, and while I was around meeting all these various people, I thought, what a great time to kind of ask all these guys the same couple of questions and sort of see the gamut of opinions as far as people's favorite types of aquariums. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Fish Guy Meets Fish Guys, also edition. So uh, what do you do in the aquarium industry? I am what is called an aquarist. You know, I take care of the fish, life support, water quality. We kind of do everything. I am an aquarist at a small five-acre park. And I heard you say Down in St. Thomas. Thomas. That's very interesting. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So you're, you're off the mainland running a small aquarium. <laughs> yes, we do. Yes, very yes. cool. So I work for the University of New England. Um, I help with the students, so we teach them some um, life support stuff. I also take care of our um, 600,000-gallon flow-through seawater system. And in my part-time, I take care of a tank at the local Cabela's. Nice. What kind of fish in the Cabela's tank? Uh, freshwater fish from the, all the way in the state of Maine. All right. So what do you do in the industry? I research lobsters at the University of New England. Uh, I'm a student at the University of New England. All right. Any <laughs> aspirations? Yeah, I do a lot of aquaculture research, so mainly bivalves and things of that nature. Um, I'm first, I'm from Nassau. Um, I'm the life support manager at the aquarium. Um, I've been doing this for the last 13 years, nice. and it's been great. And favorite all-time aquarium or exhibit? I would have to say it's probably Blue Cavern at Aquarium of the Pacific. It's about 30 feet deep. They've got giant sea bass, leopard sharks, a whole schooling sardines, like absolutely everything that's temperate water. It's great. Excellent choice. Well, I uh, I like the Newport Aquarium just because it's it's close to home. We go there quite a quite a bit, and uh, we uh, we have real good relations with uh, with Jeff and, and the whole group there. And my favorite exhibit is at the Toledo Zoo, the um, turtle and uh, ray exhibit. It's actually see-through. You can walk down one hallway, walk through the other, and you can see the animals in all their glory on both sides. It's awesome. Very cool. Favorite aquarium of all time, Baltimore, mainly for uh, the National Aquarium in Baltimore. Okay. Uh, mainly for sentimental reasons, uh, but they have some really awesome stuff. Hey, sentimental reasons are good reasons. Exactly. <laughs> I really like the Newport Aquarium because it's really close to us and I can take my kids down there and I love the, the chance to pet the penguins. Awesome. So probably the favorite is one of ours and it is a four foot by four foot by four foot uh, freshwater baby alligator tank. And it is at one of our resorts that we manage and um, the grunts or baby alligators called grunts. Um, we have six of them as a display, and um, the personalities they have is unbelievable. So in tune with what we do and how they react with us, so really becomes a favorite because they're they're cute and they're mean all at the same time. <laughs> Uh, we went to the Denver Aquarium last year. I'd say that's my favorite. Yeah. At last year's also? Yep. Awesome. Of course, being from Louisiana, it's the Aquarium of Americas that I've been to. I totally agree. And what is your favorite aquarium or single exhibit that you've ever seen? St. Louis Zoo Polar Bear Exhibit. Wow. All the way. Didn't want to think about that at all, no. huh? All right. Awesome. <laughs> I really like the pig nose turtle exhibit at the St. Louis Zoo. <laughs> All right, a lot of St. Louis. Cool. All right, awesome. Thank you very much. It's going to be St. Louis again, but it's the Herpetarium. Herpetarium at St. Louis. All right, awesome. All right, and uh, same question, favorite aquarium or exhibit all time? Uh, probably, again, the Herpetarium there at St. Louis Zoo. St. Louis Zoo Herpetarium wins again. It's actually here in St. Louis. Um, I think the sea lions exhibit was really cool. Right on. Okay. Um, my favorite aquarium is a tie right now between <laughs> Pinal Shores North Carolina Aquarium and the Georgia Aquarium right now. Um, simply because I think a lot of training happens at that Pinal Shore Aquarium and I, I, I like the work ethic at the Pinal Shore Aquarium. But Georgia is my best visual aquarium 
you know, that Odyssey Aquarium, I've seen firsthand and how it operates. I've never seen an aquarium run like that before in my life. And I can't, you know, and I can say it's similar to what we have in the Bahamas, but that no backwashing water, I've never heard that before <laughs> compared to what we have. So, yeah. yeah, that's the most unique I've seen from I've been doing this now. Cool. All right, thank you, Fish Guy. This episode is brought to you by you, our listeners. People who support our show can go to patreon.com slash fishnerds and make a small weekly donation to the show. I'm asking all listeners to give us $1 per episode, which is like four bucks a month. If all of our listeners would do that, if everyone would do that, I can quit my job and just be a podcaster. I spend money on good equipment. I can pay Nick to mix the show. I can pay our producers around the world to make their segments and get their quality better. I could take my wife out for dinner, which is more important than you might think when you podcast for free all the time. So go to patreon.com slash fishnerds, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash fishnerds, and help us crowdfund the show. Remember, a dollar an episode makes a big, big difference. If you donate at the $2 level, I'll mail you a Fish Nerds Hoorag. If you donate at the $5 level, you get a Fish Nerds hat. If you do at the $25 level, which is really a big level, it's $100 a month, you'll be a sponsor of the show, like our friend Josh Lopes at lopestax.com. If you're in New England, especially Massachusetts, and you want your tax, some help with taxes or your accounting, go to lobestax.com and talk to Josh and say, hey, I like you and you're a fish nerd. Can you do my taxes for me? And he'll help you out. And maybe he'll even give you a good deal. So anyway, patreon.com slash fish nerds. And you can link, of course, on our show notes to that. It helps crowdfund the show. It really makes a big difference. It's really important. And we have to find a way to make money. We're at 180 episodes in and we're not making any money. So it'd be really great to... Get on the upside of that. All right. How about a visit to North Country Angle? All right, fish nerds. Uh... This is Clay Groves. We're hanging out at North Country Angler, the only independent fishing store in the uh, Mount Washington Valley, as far as I can tell. So the only choice of places to buy fishing gear is North Country Angler or Walmart. Uh, and I'm hang hanging out with Steve, the owner. Steve, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Clay? Uh, doing great. And you're, you're, we were here, actually, because you asked me for, uh, to help you talk about what kind of ice fishing gear should you sell. Now, you're a fly shop. So before I get into what kind of gear you should sell, what are your customers going to think about you selling ice fishing stuff? Well, see, that's a little bit of a popular misconception. While we are majority fly fishing, you know, the name of the shop's the North Country Angler. And there are plenty of people out there who enjoy other methods of fishing besides fly fishing. I didn't know there was any other kind of fishing. <laughs> <laughs> So, and we get a lot of people that come in that are interested in angling for bass, for perch, for sunfish, for pike. And because we are the only independent shop in the valley, we want to service everybody and make sure that they have an enjoyable time on the water. Right. And everyone, you know, all, all kinds of fishing is fun, right? So we're all nerdy about our, and, and you get, you get the nerdiest kind of fishermen. I mean, these fly guys, you get in here, you walk in here and, and any given day, and there's some guy talking about some hackle hair caddis nymph trout thing, and he'll talk about it for three hours and never have a point. Just wants to say the word caddis a thousand times, <laughs> which is amazing. But so you've got in this store, it's mostly fly fishing, but you've got like a, I want to say like a five foot section of wall that's about six feet tall that you're going to dedicate to ice fishing this year. So you said, hey, Clay, you're an ice fishing guide. Help me figure out what to sell. Correct. I mean, it's definitely not my uh, wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. You know, I am one of those crazy fly fishers that you were just talking about that can talk about every caddis that's on the face of the earth. But um, as I said before, getting out on the water, catching fish, 
Uh, we're all one big brotherhood, and uh, we want to service the customer right. And with you uh, being the premier ice fishing guide yeah. here <laughs> in the uh, Mount Washington Valley, what better source of information to make sure I have the right right equipment for everyone? Right. It's easy to be the best when you're the only one, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, And I should preface this. You, you, you are not an ice fishing virgin. Last year, you came ice fishing with me. We fished for like 10 minutes. How'd it go? It, it was unbelievable. I mean, the method, I've never fished that way. I was a tip-up ice fishing guy before I went out with you. So sad. <laughs> yeah, and, um, and uh, Clay said, no, we're going to jig. And he drilled my two holes, and he put the sonar down one hole, and we put the jig down the other hole, and boom, within 10 minutes, I had a 20-inch Laker. Yeah, and, and let's talk about the jig you were using, because you weren't using a traditional ice fishing jig. You were stubborn, and you said, I'm going to use a fly. So let's talk about that for a second. Yep, yep. I said, I said to Clay, do you mind if we try to use flies on this? And he said, whatever you want to put in the hole. So um, we've developed a series of flies called the Mop Fly. It's a heavily weighted jig type fly. Uh, it comes in a variety of colors, and this particular lake trout went crazy over fluorescent orange. So uh, it was exciting, and I think Clay thought I was a little out of my mind when I said I'm going to use flies to uh, jig with. But uh, I don't. I don't think it's that crazy because I have a different attitude. Like most guides are like, you know, you must use the clam tungsten jig, or you must use this specific brand thing. And I don't think most brands are better than the other, and most styles are better than the other. And I'm pretty sure, and I've always said this, and I, and I have a lot of experience catching a variety of kinds of fish, uh, and this is where I differ from, different, different from fly fisher brains, is I think fish eat whatever's in front of them. And most of the time, if it's small enough to get in their mouth, they're going to take a bite of it and taste it. And so I'm not shocked that worked. Um, if I thought it wouldn't work, I would have told you to not do it. Because <laughs> it doesn't benefit me to take you ice fishing and you not have fish, uh, catch fish when you've got a fly shop and people are going to stop in here and, and, and ask for, for advice on, on fishing. So. Well, uh, I'm glad to hear that you weren't shocked because I was. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, it's like that was the day we took the radio fishing, and they got a fish in like three seconds as well. So right. that was like just right. perfect. Yep, yeah. yep. That's why you're the premier guy. The premier. All right. So <laughs> let's talk about what kind of gear you're thinking about. So do you have a vision for like what kind of ice fishing section you want to have? Well, last year was my first time in the shop, and first winter owning the shop. And um, people started to come in to ask about what I had for ice fishing gear, and uh, they were asking for jigging equipment. So we started with a basic eagle claw jigging outfit, some, uh, some trout magnets, some uh, Swedish pimples, just some really, really basic stuff, and we sold it all. Which is amazing, right? Very amazing yeah. for a fly shop to sell all of that ice fishing equipment. Well, remember, in the Valley, there's nowhere else to buy stuff at Walmart, and people don't feel like going in there because it takes too long and no one knows anything, so it's challenging. Right, and um, as far as I could tell from the uh, jigging equipment that I selected, uh, we were very competitive with what Walmart was trying to do. Yeah, I mean, I saw that. So, so you're thinking that jigging mostly, and so we're going to be looking through a catalog here from your distributor. They've got a variety of stuff on here. Uh, I'm going to recommend, and I'm not going to read the whole book on the podcast here, but I'm going to recommend when we think about jigging rods, we get a, a couple of different thicknesses and weights. But really more important than that is I want to talk about the different kinds of things you might be hanging under the rod. Perfect. Right. So, like, what kind of lures are you going to carry, right? I would totally think it would be really smart of you to figure out some ice flies, to really kind of have something unique that maybe you tie in the shop or that you purchase to sell that are that are flies. Because I think people get excited about something that's different and that's fuzzy and pretty. I'm a fan of using pink as my go-to color for ice fishing for brook trout. So bright pink colors are really, really good. Um, so do, do something unique and that will separate you a little bit. And then I'll tell you about what we should buy. Well, it's funny that you should say that because I've already bought pink mops to be able to make pink mop jigs. <laughs> I can't even say, yeah, say that well, three times fast. Well, the early brook trout fishing is going to start in about two weeks. We should be getting into some broodstock, brook trout, as soon as there's skim ice. And when there's about two inches of ice, we go out uh, and we fish about a foot up deep of water. So we're, if we fall through, we can just step out of the hole. And we always <laughs> fall through. Uh, but the brook trout come into really, really shallow water. And pink, Vinny and I use these hot, anything hot pink we use. And it doesn't matter what it is, the fish gobble it up. So... That's two weeks from now. Well, on those mop flies, we put um, UV dubbing around the head so that even when you're fishing in deeper water, 
we get the color refraction from any of the any of the light that's coming through the ice. So oh, good. Well, we'll have to check them out. So I see in here you've got little Clio spoons, one eighth ounce. That last year, that spoon, I caught so many bass fishing with with the one eighth ounce little Clios. So I, I love spoons. Uh, last year was my first year fishing with spoons, and the first half of the season we were all tiny jigs with little pieces of maggot or pieces of. Um, uh, butterworm or some other kind of meat on there and then about halfway through we were finding out we we're only catching these tiny yellow perch all the time we switched to spoons little cleos and a couple other brands and uh we cleaned up nice nice so, good. the little cleos a good freshwater yeah. uh, spinner as well so yeah they're great they're great little spoons any spoon is really good uh cast masters great choice and then we're going to talk about the jigs you're going to want to get have to be tungsten right yes yep or you want a tungsten or <laughs> well other. well whatever's heavy heavy but smaller right dense right so yeah small with these and i'm a big fan of them bright bright glows on them and single blade so you can bait people can put bait on them so you know uh, and and all these any of these would work just fine. You've got lots of eagle claw choices in here. Um, I always like deadly dicks, but I've never fished with them because I just like the name. It's, <laughs> 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 so so you want a variety of spoons and a variety of jigs. People really like them. And don't be afraid to get some higher end jigs and eagle claw. Um, these packages of jigs are are kind of generic, but if you could find. Some very nice higher end jigs. They okay. have little crystals embedded in them. Uh, people go bananas. I'll pay six dollars a jig. Okay. Easy. okay. I won't. Good. But lots of people will. And all this, these Lindy's and the Frosty Spoons and the Slicks. These are all um, pretty good. The Lindy, Lindy Darter, the, the one eighth ounce for crappie fishing. It's a good okay. go to. You also get bass on that and everything else. So it's that's a good that's a good. Do you one. ever go higher than eighth ounce and stuff? I you know I occasionally do from if, if I'm lake trout fishing I might go quarter ounce. But here's my theory on fishing is is huge fish and you know this from fly fishing eat tiny things, right? And small fish eat tiny things, and I don't like not catching fish. So I fish small, and that way I catch a lot of fish, including the big ones. Right. So there's I don't get, I get bored. <laughs> so I'm like I'm like a little kid with fishing. So. <laughs> I don't like to go big. Um, I will go a quarter ounce on occasion, but eighth ounce is, is my happy place. Okay. All right. Great. So, good. Um, but yeah, all these are really good choices. And a lot of people love these shad wraps, these jigging shad wraps. And when you jig them up, these rapala, they call them rapala or rapala. I don't know how to rapala, say Rapala, yep. They, when you jig them, they swim in these huge, huge circles. Ah, uh, okay. Which is great for really bringing in the fish and yellow perch and stuff. We'll go bananas for it. A lot of people use them as attractors. So they'll jig it for a while. And they'll pull the fish in, then they'll switch to a teardrop jig and drop that down and pull those fish right out of there. PK is a great company. Oh, like, okay. This is a company, um, a few years ago, that's all I used. Fantastic. This is probably, in fact, this will separate you from Walmart if you carry PK spoons. People catch tons of fish on these. The company, PK, once sent me everything in their catalog. Oh, wow. Because I was having such a good winter with them, and I kept sharing pictures, and I got this huge package from them with everything. I had, and I, nice. They're great, great jigs. So PK is a good, it's a small company, which, which I would prefer. That's my preference is always a small So one. you said before that you like pink for trout. Yeah. What other colors do you like to fish, fish with? Oh, I like gold. Uh, like if you have a jig and it's um, like a spoon and it's got gold on one side, silver on the other. Copper colors are all okay. really, really good. Blues work really well. I hate chartreuse. Oh, really? I hate it. You know why I hate it? No. I don't know what the hell it is. Oh. Because okay. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to tell you how many trout I caught this summer on chartreuse. Everyone can't just think about chartreuse. I don't know what it means. And, like, and like you ask four different anglers, what is chartreuse? You're going to get four different, like if you had like a color wheel with different shades of green, which one is chartreuse? No one knows. Oh, that's yeah. well, that's true. I hate it. I hate it. Just say green. I hate I hate it. Anyway, um, PK, please buy okay. PK. Stop okay. Those are you got it. Fantastic. You got it. Fantastic. Fantastic jigs. That's, in fact, you probably could just get a variety of those for your spoons. And be done. And be done. Okay. Um, because they're so good, and they work so, so well. I love it. PK, the flutter fishes are great for, for big lake trout and uh, white perch. Um, predators, I mean, these are all so good. I like the look at this crippled herring here from Lure Jensen. Well, Lure uh, Jensen is a really big uh, designer of lures for non-ice fishing. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, They've gotten really creative over the years with doing stuff that's production airbrushed mm -hmm. and make sure that stuff that the stuff that they're making looks like the actual bait fish. So. Right, and again, and that's more for that's that's for the angler, not for the fish, because the fish don't care. 
Right. So that's <laughs> right. Right. Well. <laughs> so so that's that's where I kind of would be. Obviously, Swedish pimples, but I wouldn't stock a ton of them because that's what Walmart's got all of. Gotcha. You know, okay. I mean, they've got little Cleos at Walmart too, and all all the Eagle Claw stuff. So that's why I'm really like looking at what does Walmart not have, and what can set you out. Now you want, of course, have what they have. Plus, you want to have better stuff. The PK will will be that. That's better than that. And there's another. Haley makes a jig, which I don't see in your book here. That's got a. It's a long jig with a chain and a hook on it. Oh, and I have seen those. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're great because they're huge. Action looks like a little yellow perch eating when you jig the bottom. Oh. And they're great too for ice fishing because you don't need to clean your ice holes out. They, they're so dense, they just punch right through the slush and right down into the fish. And if you're, if you're perch fishing, which I do a lot of, uh, it's a great early uh, season perch jig. So I don't see those on here, but I think, um, yeah, those some of them are similar. But um, these Lord Jensen's are similar. But imagine that with a chain and then the hook. Gotcha. Just a short piece of chain. Okay. They're really All right. Great. Well, I can call and ask about yeah, that. Yeah, they're called sure. they're called Haley jigs. I just love them. But beyond that, I mean, you keep it simple. You don't need a ton of stuff. I wouldn't do bait buckets or bait traps or any of that kind of stuff. I no, no. I mean, honestly, I mean, when you want to go ice fishing, you want it to be clean, easy, and fun, like you're saying. Yeah. And when you start adding, hauling a bait bucket and driving around trying to even find live bait anymore, you can waste half your day trying to find live bait. So. Yeah. I mean, good, are you going to carry any bait at all? Uh, no. 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 So people can, they can come here, they can pick up their jigs. And then on their way to the fishing spots, which are all south of here, they can stop at the pet stores. Now we have two big pet stores in town, and they can pick up wax worms there. Oh, want to okay. Yeah, or you can pick some up and just repackage them. <laughs> 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 because that's the, the only um, the only bait I bring on ice now is uh, wax worms or maggots. Something fits in your pocket. Um, right. And I, I rarely put tip-ups out. I, don't, I saw you have, you have some old tip-ups out front, I saw. Yeah, those are my dad's. Your dad's, <laughs> yeah. The, people may want to buy tip-ups. And if you do do tip-ups, do better than what Walmart has. Go high-end. Um, find some really, really good ones that are ready to fish with, that are already rigged up and ready to go. So I, I don't know what Walmart's selling these days, but uh, most of them are garbage. Um, the heritage are pretty nice, but go higher end on the tip ups. People will buy really good ones. Okay. If you just sell the same garbage Walmart has, I can't compete. You so. can't compete. You'll be pricing more than them anyway. So so go go high quality. I don't buy those. Uh, okay. <laughs> those those would be the Eagle Claw, like really thin wood ones. They're cheap. Okay. Um, or don't sell tip ups if you don't. You know, if you want to encourage people to jig, say this is what we're selling. This is what people are doing. And if they don't know how to do it, say yeah. You know, you can always call the fish nerds and they'll take you fishing, teach you how to fish with them. Uh, and then, you know, you might, some fun accessories. People love little chairs and lights, and you could decide whether you want, you want to carry any, any shelters. People well, will buy them. I mean, the philosophy here at the North Country Angler is, is we try to provide for what the customer that's coming in wants. Sure. So, um, obviously, I'm expanding mm -hmm. the ice fishing assortment because of what we learned last year. And if next year we find out that people want ice fishing shelters, we'll have them for next year. People, so people, people will buy your shelters if you have them. They also will rent them if you have them. Ah. And, and so you could, these, these, are, these, these uh, Eskimo quick flips and the fat fishes, these fold up into a, into a carrying bag that's pretty small. And I mean, they probably, I don't know your cost on them, but even the retailer, they're like 200 bucks be the high end of these things, right? And and uh, you can rent them out, and you can make your money so fast on that. Because a lot of people fishing don't want to own the gear, you know. So right, like, right, yeah. We had a lot of people. Like I had a, a family in from Connecticut this morning that's interested in do, coming up and doing some ice fishing, and they, uh, you know, they're going to need all the equipment when they get here to go do that. Just with have you. them hire so, me. Well, you I know? sold them. I said, here, here, here's the guy you want to talk to. Yeah. <laughs> and and if you do carry ice augers. I hate these. I hate these. I hate these Eskimo hand augers. <laughs> I know you have one. Well, you have a slit. You you have a very slick setup though with your uh, your electric drill there. But even without that, that same drill I use in Nils hand auger. They're made in Finland, and they even even the hand auger you'll drill through the ice faster than any power auger. They're sharper. They're better for cutting, uh, and people love them. If you could carry a Nils auger, you would sell it very, very quickly. Okay. It won't stay on your shelves. You, you have a hard time keeping those on the shelves. I just, okay. I just had one delivered to my house today. In fact, oh wow! Okay, yeah. nice. And I had to get them from Fish USA. I couldn't. There's no one. No one locally is carrying them. Of course, no. No Walmart has them. Uh, Dick Sporting Goods doesn't carry them. They're just they're really difficult to get locally. But you know, I think Cabela's has them. Uh, is the nearest gotcha. place to get them. So. Gotcha. Um, yeah, and of course, you know, people need ice scoops and stuff. 
These are these little cheap plastic HT skimmers. They retail like two dollars a piece. They're, they're super cheap. I always have like six or seven of those with me when I fish with the kids. Every kid gets a skimmer. They love scooping <laughs> holes out. It's it's the weirdest thing. <laughs> they love it. So, but I I think diversity, a good variety of jigs and spoons, but high quality. Do, okay. Do better than Walmart, and I think you'll do, you'll crush. You'll do really really well. Awesome. So, and as you get going, if you need any more, you know, tips or whatever, just you know, tell me. Well, the um, let's just let's just quickly touch on rods because mm -hmm. I did. Oh, notice, we didn't talk about rods, I did, did we? I did notice um, that there's different lengths. Yeah. Last year, I only brought in the 24 inch. 24 is a good a, a good one to have, and I would go with different action. Last year, you had really you had a really thick, heavy duty rod. And for me, I like to go something that's like a almost like a trout rod, really, okay. really sensitive. So people who are fishing for um, for panfish, which is a lot of action around here, you want that sensitive tip so you can feel the bite or see the bite. Fish in the winter, a lot of them you can like if you're crappie fishing, a lot of times you won't even feel the hit oh, on, okay. a, on a thicker rod, and you'll have a fish on there you won't even notice them. So you really want a variety of those, but not a ton. If you get two or three high quality rods, you're, you're solid. And don't buy any that come with string on them already. Okay. Because they come with garbage on them. Okay. You know, and, yep. and what you'll do is people will buy them and they'll go fishing and they'll get this big nest of garbage on there and they'll blame you. So right. you, you'd feel better if you sold them, you know, a, a, an outfit and then you sold them some high quality ice fishing line with it. And that's not expensive stuff. But right, it, right. But when you put it on yourself, it's better. Yeah, Berkeley makes some good stuff. But the ice fishing model is really good. Uh, Floricom is great. And if you can get colors. Reds, pinks, yellows, because they show up on the ice really well. And if you're tangled up and you're ice fishing cold already, red line on the ice, you're in good right. shape. Right. Yeah. Perfect. So yeah, get a variety, but um, try not to get one that comes with string. If they do, take the string off them. <laughs> just don't oh no, even... no! I definitely have the option to get them with and without. Yeah, so. they just they put the worst garbage on them. Well, know? like you said, the worst problem is is they were made in China two years ago, and they've ago. and they've sat there with the line on them for two years, and the memory and the line is horrible. That line memory. Now, a little trick too, and I've never done this with a store bought rod, but if you've bought line memory on a spinning reel, run it under like scalding hot water. Right. And it removes the memory. Right. Just put that reel under the water. Yeah. But better off, just put some better quality line on it. <laughs> so, and so, many, so many people get frustrated with, with their fishing because they get tangled. They put too much line on it, too heavy a test, and it's, it's too low quality. So it makes a big difference. And your strength? Four pounds. Right. Four pound test, two right. pound test. I know people who fish with palm rods. Have you seen palm rods? No. There's a, it's, a, it's a competitive ice fishing overseas. It's, a, it's a, like an eight inch fishing rod. And they use, they use like half pound tippet material to string it. The whole thing. Wow. And that's what they're fishing with. And they're, they're people who competitively fish in Finland and Russia, Team USA. They're using palm rods, super ultra light, with a um, with a spring bobber on the end of it. Wow, so, yeah, that's crazy. crazy. Yeah, yeah, I've never seen them in the stores, but but anyway. So yeah, so that that's enough information to get you dirty. Yes, yes, I'm I'm excited. I'm glad you were able to stop by today and help me out. We'll be placing our order on Monday, cool. and we'll be ready to go next weekend. Oh, good, because it won't take long before this ice sets in, so we'll be in good shape. And Monday, you say you place an order. That's the day this podcast is being released. So Ah, excellent. Perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're and that's welcome. northcountryangler.com? Dot com, and you can also call me at 603-356-6000. And uh, we ship for free. Hey. Shipping's free. And the great state of New Hampshire, there's no sales tax. It's a beautiful thing. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Okay, time for your first effin' review, Fish Nerds Review, where I look at a product and tell you what I think. This week's product is the Milwaukee M12 Heated Hoodie. That is a hooded sweatshirt with a heater in it. And as an ice fisherman, that to me sounds fabulous. I love, love the idea of it. Um, it's a nice looking black hoodie. It's comfortable, it fits well, and that's a positive. The battery charged up under an hour. Also a positive. Uh, that retails for about 150 at Home Depot and Amazon, wherever it happened to be. I won mine uh, on a fishing uh, page called 603 Outpost on Facebook. So I, I like winning stuff, which is great. 
On the box, it says up to six hours of heat per charge. Uh, and it's got a, a, a big old battery charger. So here's what the charger looks like. It's, it looks like the charger for like your Ryobi or your Milwaukee, like big power tools. It's a huge charger. A charger probably six by four by three. Not really pocket size. The battery itself is about six inches long and about uh, two inches in diameter, two and a half inches in diameter. And it fits in the back, in a little zipper pocket in the back of the jacket. It turns on a little red button on your uh, breastplate uh, and it's comfortable and it heats up pretty good when you're inside. Now tonight I wore it outside for about three hours on high and the, the heat only heated for about an hour and a half, maybe two hours before it turned off. So I guess the six hour capacity is on low, but I can't imagine anyone ever wearing this thing on low. Yeah, up to six hours of runtime. It's got three heat settings um, and it heats the chest and the back. And it, it was comfortable and I kept kind of warm. I think this would be really good as a, as a base layer, but if you wear it just on the outside of your clothes, the wind will suck that heat out of you just as fast. And uh, the, the night, oh, I guess the battery is interchangeable with all the M12 tools, which is uh, good if you're a Milwaukee person, which I'm not. Um, but overall, I, you know, I love the idea of like heated jackets and heated socks and heated gloves and all that stuff. But I think if you really want to be safe, maybe you want to have really good layers. For $150, to me, this is not a good buy. I think you can buy a lot of really great layers, base layers for your clothes that you can be much safer and warmer longer in than that. But if you get a chance to get one for free, then totally do it. I wear it um, in the mornings in my house when I'm cold, don't want to put heat on. It's like wearing a, like a heated blanket. It's not bad. Again, I wouldn't spend the money on it, but... You know, if someone gives it to you, you know, keep it, enjoy it, have fun with it. So that's the M12 Milwaukee heated hoodie. And uh, yeah, I'm sure a lot of you will happen this year on the ice and you can tell me I'm wrong if you think I'm wrong. I mean, you know, maybe I am. So that's the, that's the Beckham Park Review of the Week. All right, we're back. How about, how about this? How about we talk about the F and West? The Amazing James and Fish Guy Josh from California have been part of the show for a couple of years. Now, the Fish Guy Josh, you heard him early in the show tonight. He's doing the Fish Guy Meets Fish Guy, Fish Guy segment, but he started off doing the F and West with the Amazing James. And they started off as fans of the show, and now they're part of the show. We haven't heard from the Amazing James in a long, long time. He's back with the F and West. I'm Amazing James. And I'm Fish Guy Josh. And, and we, we are F, F and West. West. Let's, let's grab a couple of glasses, fish guy. Beef? Yeah, those look good. Nice. I got a beer right here. Oh, that the, I told you it was already the open. The cap of a crisp, freshly opened beer. <laughs> it was... That you just flipped off of your thumb. <laughs> yeah. I'm really that... I'm just that strong. I can open beer with my bare thumb. What is this? This is the Kerhoppen. I think it's a take on the, the Kraken. Kraken. Yeah. It's, uh, I like, do you like that label? Mm hmm. It's a pretty cool label. I th it's pretty cute. Hopping. What is that called? What kind of, kind of dive mask the is dive that? Bell. The dive bell. The old school dive bell. With pictures of tendrils from a hops plant taking down an old boat. Evans Brewing Company from Orange County since 1994. Man, that's old. Dang. There's, wow. Well, I got kids working for me that weren't even born then. Cheers, foamy. <clears throat> so, so um, I bought a bunch all of foam right now. all foam. Yeah, it's, I, I, come on, I'm not a bartender. I, I never learned how to pour a beer. Get on the side of the glass, man. Come on, yeah. It's not that bad. <clears throat> I looked it up, uh, and apparently it's won a couple of awards. But I don't know if they've been really popular. Awards. Check the label out. Whoa. They split the label to look like the state of California instead of like being cut like a square. The ends actually... That's kind of cool. That is kind of cool. Dang. I found out it's a publicly traded company. These two brothers... <clears throat> no. In this particular? No. So anyway, so um, as you're aware, I was on a mission to collect as many fish beers as possible. Yes, I remember that. And I was thinking about <clears throat> maybe we could uh, do some sort of a segment on fish beers, since fish beers are popular and stuff. 
Um, and since right now... Are they popular and stuff? <laughs> well, I mean, think about it. Mar from a marketing standpoint, <clears throat> marketers think that fishermen all drink beer, right? Like, I, I always get drunk off my ass when I go fishing, don't you? <laughs> it's true. No, it's not. Beer is an integral part of it. Of a lot of fishing. It, a lot of fishing. Not all fishing, though. It's it's rare for me. Because it need to have you need to have a hand hold the beer while you're fishing, and that's hard. So it's like for it's for drowning worms, essentially, mm -hmm. or like chugging along on your boat and pulling a sardine that's half falling apart. Anyway, <clears throat> so um, it's not bad. No, it's not bad. I don't like IPAs, but it's pretty good. It is pretty good. I'm, I'm also not an IPA fan. Anyway, so um, <clears throat> I had... The... I... Wow, 6%. Mm. That's pretty standard. <clears throat> I had a uh, collection of about mm, 50 at one point. And yeah. so, since then, half of them have disappeared. I don't, I, well, you know, you go fishing. You don't oh. go fish beer. You know where they disappear too. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I figured maybe we can get together every once in a while, have a beer, talk about it, talk fishing. About a fish beer? Yeah, talk about a fish beer and talk about fishing. Have you caught anything lately? Uh, yeah, I went camping and got um, went camping at Indian Valley Reservoir for carp. Carp and catfish were our targets. They weren't big carp yeah but it was fun because i've been like trying to catch really big carp for so long now that it's it was nice to get into like a a lake where they were just they weren't that big in general so it was you know it was cool just catch a different size class and we caught some catfish too nice and i was trying out my i took my my new fishing bivy for a spin so that it's was fishing the whole, bivy the Is that whole a point tent? Yeah, you know, the tent thing you saw. Oh, yeah, I did see yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That thing was huge. It weighed a ton. It's not that big. Well, but it weighs a lot. Well, it had, like, all the extra, like, heavy-duty um, tent. Like, it has, like, a room. Like, the, t the bottom is not connected to the tent. Right. So you can just put it on dirt or put a light tarp or... It, it had, like... The full bore, full weather stuff in that bag that you lift up. So you can like customize it and pull out all the stuff you don't <laughs> need. Excuse me. Sorry. <clears throat> so you're saying you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily take that on the ET? I mean it doesn't have a bottom? Like is it just a, is it more or less like a sunshade? No. It's uh it's more like a bottomless tent that has a tarp bottom you can lay down first instead. Okay. So you can peg in the tent without the bottom, or you can peg in the ground sheet too. How do you keep rain out? Like if you have a tarp down and then you have something on top of it, doesn't the tarp just collect the water in it? It... Does it somehow... I mean, most of your water flows under it, mm -hmm. under the tarp, the bivy walls have little extended flaps so you can tuck under the tarp. Ah. Okay. But it's for, it's like an English carp fishing one. So I guess typically the weather's pretty shitty there. And it rains a lot. So they all sleep on like raised cot beds. In Britain. Yeah. So they don't care that the bottom is <clears throat> not covered. You know what I mean? Like... They're used, right. they're 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 in the mud and you're, all. You're that also stuff. in the woods. You don't want to sleep on the ground anyway. You're probably carrying a cot or something. Yeah. So they're right. sleeping on the they call them bed chairs. So they're sleeping on these raised bed chairs. I tried it sleeping okay. on the mat on the on the actual floor with my insulated mat just to right. see how I like it. But this is California. We don't have bugs. We have bugs, but not like not like crazy mosquitoes. Yeah. Hey, um, <clears throat> did you catch any catfish? Mm -hmm. How big? Mm, probably like. A foot and a half or something I like nice good like keeper edible size like not crazy big but not a tiny guy did you keep any i let uh my buddy was there 
and he wanted to bring some home. So I, I let him keep the catfish because I brought some fish fillets with us in case we didn't catch anything because I brought the deep fryer and all that stuff. So we what? fish fry like out there. Okay, so you and me need to go to Lake Sonoma. I don't know when, but we need to go to Lake Sonoma because the last time I went with the kids, we caught that 10 pound catfish I told you about. Mm-hmm. It's not huge, but it's, I think it's actually the biggest I mean, catfish I've ever caught. A nice it's a good sized fish, yeah. But I told you how ridiculous it was that mm-hmm. I was actually bluegill fishing and pulled in the first time a chomped up bluegill. On your line, bluegill line. On my bluegill line. And then <clears throat> this guy came in the second time, bent over the rod, and I barely caught it with like this tiny little like size 8 hook or, eight, or 10 hook, mm-hmm. just barely in the corner of the lip. And I'm pretty sure it did the same thing. It like chomped a bluegill so but that happened two more times on that trip and yeah. it was a it was just like an overnight with the kids at a blast is it campground right by the water or boating campsites yep you need to you need to oh boat. that's cool and this is the first time i took a power boat of my own which was really cool so we should yeah man, you've improved your boat status quite a bit boat status is up i, I gained some um like mario points or something so video video game video game points like what what's the little bar at the top of the screen like depends on the game <laughs> yeah I know right <clears throat> anyways your power ratings up so this was a good beer huh that's pretty good not bad for an IPA yeah Evans Brewing Company the Kerhoppen and uh, you should uh, I guess the nerds should should look this up it's a pretty cool looking bottle yeah you and, should send uh, a photo of the bottle I think we'll do that we'll post a photo of the bottle in the California label and all that stuff so sweet all right cool all right cheers i'm fish guy josh it's amazing james and this is is the fn West. west okay so that's it you've listened to a bunch of fish nerds when you should have been fishing special thanks to fish guy josh the amazing james steve at north country angler and of course all of you for listening Uh, So until next time, follow the code of the fish nerds, spawn early and often, avoid free lunches with strings attached, and swim against the current every chance you get. And next week we'll be back. My voice will be regular and I won't have such a cold and we'll we'll all be happy and joyous again. (laughs) 